faster downloads, less buffering, wireless virtual reality, smart cities. These are all some things that society hopes to achieve by implementing 5G technology. But while that's exciting and progressive, people are growing exceedingly cautious about this new technology. Is this worry just us being overly cautious or does it come with valid concerns? Today we are going to be talking about just that. First, I'm going to be talking to you about 5G technology and some of the physics behind it. Then, we're going to be talking about radiation and the electromagnetic spectrum. After that, we're going to explore some of the current protective measures put in place by the government to protect us from radiation. Then, we are going to explore some of the current science that supports society's growing concerns about 5G technology. Specifically, since we're a neuroscience channel, we're going to look at the relationship between 5G technology and gliomas. And finally, we're going to try to come up with a conclusion as to whether or not 5G technology is safe for us to use. So sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you can stay up to date with all our neuroscience videos. With that being said, let's get started. So first of all, we're going to be talking about what 5G is. 5G is electromagnetic radiation that is also sometimes coined millimeter wavelength radiation. And so this technology emits invisible wavelengths through our atmosphere. The question is, how long are these wavelengths? Because the electromagnetic spectrum consists of many different types of waves. According to Verizon, the length of a 5G wavelength tends to fall in between 28 gigahertz to 39 gigahertz. This can be compared to 4G technology, which usually falls in between 700 megahertz to 2500 megahertz. To put that into perspective, that would be 0.7 gigahertz and 2.5 gigahertz compared to the higher 30 gigahertz wavelengths. So, what do these waves do and how do we have a cell phone conversation with wavelengths? Well, these waves encode information, such as the voice and the audio that we hear through a cell phone. It's the same way that we get information on the radio, but that information is delivered with radio waves. So what happens is these waves pulsate at different lengths, and then that is translated to the information that we hear. So. I mentioned radio waves, and radio waves and 5G waves actually both fall on the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is a spectrum that includes all the wavelengths and all forms of radiation. So this can include familiar things that you've probably heard of such as X-rays, UV rays, gamma rays, cosmic rays, radio waves, and infrared or heat waves. The wavelength that we are most familiar with is the visible spectrum, and so this would be what we call light. These visible waves include different colors like red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and it's actually a very small portion of the spectrum. Properties of light include the ability to reflect and the ability to be absorbed, like when you look into a mirror and the light is reflected back at you. All the wavelengths can be reflected or absorbed, they just have different properties based off of their length. So, they can also be termed ionizing or non-ionizing waves, and this has to do with the amount of energy that a wavelength carries. There's actually an equation that is E equals HF. It states the energy of a wavelength is actually directly proportionate to the frequency of a wave. So the higher frequency a wave is, the more energy it carries, and the more likely it is going to be able to ionize an atom. So let me explain this a little bit better. Wavelength could be long and slow, so if you have a long wavelength, you have a low frequency, because there's not a frequent amount of peaks, because the wave is so long. If you have 
a high frequency wave, it has shorter wavelengths. That means we have more peaks, more frequent peaks in a certain amount of time. So the high frequency wavelengths have more energy and this energy can ionize atoms. What that means is when we have an atom, there's electrons surrounding a nucleus. And if energy hits the atom, that energy can cause electrons to become excited and leave the atom. This leads to the creation of ions, which can lead to different chemical reactions happening. In fact, this is how our bodies create vitamin D, by using UVB. But we also know that UV rays can cause cancer. This happens in a similar way when the UV light causes ionization of genetic material and those mutations then go unnoticed and can become carcinogenic phenotypes in a cell. So we have this ability to ionize and then we also have thermal effects, which is something you might also be familiar with from going outside in the sunlight and feeling heat, but there are also athermal effects which means effects not caused by heat. And these are things that we're less familiar with and that science is still exploring. So, because radio waves and cell phone waves are low frequency, this means that they have less energy and they're actually non-ionizing. But just because they're non-ionizing doesn't mean there aren't effects. In fact, we protect ourselves against the risks associated with radiation from cell phones. The original restrictions were developed in 1996 when there was increased use of cell phones, but these restrictions were not developed with kids in mind. And as technology progresses, we have more and more children that are using cell phones. And so with the 5G rollout, there have been two instances where scientists have urged the World Health Organization to increase the amount of restrictions on cell phone use. In fact, in 2011, the WHO classified 5G as possibly carcinogenic. And this is based on the associations between gliomas and wireless phone use. Regardless of this, the WHO still denied a petition that was put in in 2015 by 240 scientists urging stronger regulation of electromagnetic radiation and better health warning on products like cell phones. In 2017, another 5G appeal was created by 400 scientists and physicians, and this was submitted to the European Union. I urge you to read this appeal online, and you can also see the responses from the European Union based on the appeal. But let's dive into the science and particularly the neuroscience behind 5G. Currently, cell phones are approved for use using the specific anthropomorphic mannequin, or SAM. And this mannequin actually represents the top 10% of military recruits in 1989. So it's used for testing of cell phones to see if the radiation presents a high risk or a reasonable risk. However, like I said before, this is based on the top 10% of military recruits from 1989, which means it doesn't translate very well to the general population. In fact, there are better computer models that have been developed, and these models actually show that children absorb more radiation than adults. And this is because of differences in the skull thickness and also the size of a child's head. Now this is very important because the brain is the main target organ for radio frequency radiation admitted from devices. Think of it, when you're talking on your cell phone, it is right here up against your head. And so we've actually seen an increased risk of glioma and acoustic neuroma with cell phone use. So it is important that we make regulations that are transferable to the society as a whole rather than the top 10 percentile. Over the years, we have seen an increase in incidence of glioma and acoustic neurons, and particularly this was revealed in a study based in England. And the study suggests that this increase could be related to a lifestyle factor or an environmental factor. Scientists are suggesting that perhaps it is the increased use of cell phones. Other studies have looked into phone use and the occurrence of gliomas and other brain cancers, 
and they have found that 25 years or more of phone use is associated with an increased rate of glioma and 20 or more years of cell phone use is associated with an increased rate of acoustic neuroma. But maybe this is just a correlation. But we have to remain critical. Could this just be a correlation? After all, over the years, everyone has been increasing our use of cell phones. But a lot of other things have changed in society as well. So how do we know that the increased use of cell phones is actually what's causing the increased rate of glioma or acoustic neuroma? It's tough to say because with these long-term studies, there are a lot of other confounding variables. That's not to say that one day we might be able to determine if this is the case, such as how we determine that tobacco use can increase lung cancer. In fact, animal studies have been done to show that cell phone radiation can increase cancer rates. The problem with these animal studies is that the radiation is exposed to the rat's whole body rather than just the ear, and so it's tough to say if this would translate directly over to the human population. But the Ramazzini Institute did a rat lifespan study in which rats were exposed to 19 hours a day of 1.8 gigahertz wavelength. But while this led to more incidences of glioma in the rats, the difference was not significant, and it was whole body exposure. Interestingly though, because it was whole body exposure, we did actually see a significant increase in heart schwannomas at the high dose of radiation. So what does this mean? It's hard to say. It seems that there is some sort of correlation between radiation and cancer, but we can't exactly pinpoint it yet. These are preliminary studies and there may be long-term effects of cell phone radiation. But as I mentioned, with long-term effects and long-term studies, we lose control over confounding variables. We have to remain critical about the information we come across in order to make educated decisions. So if you are interested, I urge you to do more research on your own. There's a whole bunch of links in the description and let us know what you think. Is 5G safe or is it something that worries you? Is it something that we should regulate? Let us know what you think down below. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Be sure to share with your friends so we can reach a wider audience and stay curious. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time right here on NeuroPsyQ.